Welcome. Thank and you. Thank nice you. To you. Oh, it's lovely to have you here. The way it works is is we sort of uh, we roam sure. very aimlessly throughout, throughout your back catalogue <laughs> and your personal life up to a point and your okay. professional achievements, winding up with the latest tour, the latest one man show. About your eighteenth or nineteenth, I think. Um, well, it's it's I think they're probably thirteenth um, show, but then I've done a couple of them a couple of times. I've, right, I've toured right. every year since, apart from two thousand, pretty much. You, you've also said that eighty percent of the stuff you do is for free. This, this in the context of, of explaining that over the last five or six years, you've been working pretty much seven days a week. So. I mean, have you fired your agent yet? How does that <laughs> but work? But it's, but it's by choice. And I think most of the things that I was doing for free have started to pay off now. Right. And they, and they pay off in different ways anyway. So I kind of really, I just sort of, about 10 years ago, um, we sort of, well, I, I, I was sort of aware of the internet all the time, really. You know, in the, yes. the mid-90s, me and Stu would, well, they had a website and we did quite a lot, even with the TV show. We had an email address, which was quite unusual, and you know, people could get involved. <laughs> And we we liked that, and even before the internet, though those shows were quite internetty, and that they were people got involved and contributed to them. And so I was kind of always aware that there was this, you know, new territory that you could go into. And I think well, I started writing a blog fifteen years ago, mm. and I did that partly just as a way of getting over writer's block. And then I realised, you know, if something's going up every day on a website, then people are coming to your website every day, so that's not a bad thing. And hopefully then they'll come and see you do some shows. Yes. And then with podcasting, it was just sort of the realization that you could be, you could have the autonomy, have as a stand up. You know what I love about stand up, uh, and I came back to stand up quite late, really. But what I love about it is that you know you have an idea and you put it on, and then you go and do it. So all my one man shows are completely self generated, uh, and no one tells you what I can and can't do. Which obviously you felt too many people were doing too much well it's just so difficult and it still is to get things on tv and radio and i have a fair degree of success compared to most people about getting stuff on tv and radio but But i felt like i had a lot of ideas and most of them were just disappearing into the ether so just the idea of being able to the thing that appealed to me about podcasts was just the idea of being able to make whatever you wanted to make and i didn't really care about anything else and early on people going but you're not going to make any money and go well it doesn't you know what matters is the the work yes and if the work's good then presumably that will lead to other things it's but quite you, a leap of faith though you had your fingers crossed a little bit well I just thought I, I just all the everything I've done on the internet I've just thought I'm doing this for the sake of doing it I'm not doing this you know I'm as may, an end in itself yeah maybe like when we first did Collins and Herring maybe we'd done a radio show and then stopped then we did a podcast and maybe at the back of our minds we thought hey if someone likes this maybe they'll give us a radio show back yes, you know yes. but that was that was it and then we quickly realised and we did get a radio show back in fact we got got ready for we did a radio show for a year but we quickly realised there was value in it elsewhere and especially for me because I was touring and so if you're going into people's ears every week with a you know and making them laugh and it's free then every now you know most people are going to go oh well you know A he's coming to our town let's go and see him and B I feel a bit guilty about these 50 hours of free entertainment yeah, like, yeah, so you course. know we'll give him a pound and we'll buy him a cup of coffee or <laughs> so you know it does it sort of it's like does, the big issue of the comedy <laughs> it's, world it's, <laughs> but, it's, but I suddenly realised you know and unintentionally it was a kind of brilliant yes. business model because I'm not a businessman but I noticed my tour audiences were dub- you know doubled within two or three years and I mean you say unintentionally but you were way ahead of the game on that because it's taken me quite I mean probably this actually doing this podcast it mm. took me to realise 15 years after you started that the whole nature of uh, I mean, we have to use this language until someone comes up with better words content delivery and all yeah. that sort of thing it really is changing people listening to this will be surprised to learn that someone like you you know a, a household name among the most successful comedians of your generation still felt straight jacketed by broadcasters they will presume you turn up you see someone selling out big venues or someone who's really doing the business and then the TV people just say oh come and do whatever you want on our station I mean no I mean it's really hard <laughs> you know it's really hard even when we were on you know me and Stu did TV for four or five years and we'd done radio we worked together for 10, 13 years something like that and um you know, it was still, even though we were on TV, it was a struggle to stay on and we nearly went off and then we came, we stayed on and, you know, it, it, and the regime changed and I've still got that. You know, I've just, I've written a sitcom I'm very pleased with and we did a taster tape of it and it was really good. And then everyone at the, the broadcast have changed to different and people. And then, you know, you go in and have a terrible meeting with them and go, oh, well, that three years of work has gone down the toilet. So, you know, not necessarily, hopefully someone else might do it, but it is... You know, you you do. I, I think when I was doing, I was doing the podcast, then I started doing as it occurs to me, which was like a stand up and sketch yes. weekly thing, and that kind of w- was about the same time. I, you know, I think I might have even pitched that as a radio show, and then I just realised it was just the time when all the Saxgate thing had broken with Russell Brand and mm. Jonathan Ross, and the BBC were being so overcautious. Right. 
and you sort of think, I've got this. I've got this place I can go and do whatever I want to do. And, you know, the whole thing with as it occurs to me is, I can be as rude as I like. And you go for two weeks, you're just going terrible, you know, going insane. And then you go, yeah, that's just no fun if you can, if you're allowed to do it, it's no fun. So, you know, you go back and it settles down into its own rhythm. But that freedom and that autonomy, hey, you know, because I think what's weird to me is uh, increasingly, and I think maybe it didn't used to happen so much on TV, and the things that are successful on TV, I think almost nearly always break this, is that, an executive will see someone they like and then take a leap of faith for them and go, yes. I like you, and you obviously know what you're doing, yes. so you go and do it. Whereas now, increasingly, you'll have an idea and they'll go, would it be better if this... this or if it was this, a bit like that yeah, other yeah. thing exactly, that's gone exactly. really well. And so you go, you know, I've been writing scripts for... The, you know, there was, I got the notes, I got back up my latest thing, was going, this is a bit hack and this is a bit hack. And you go, Ooh. I've been doing comedy for 30 years, okay? I go out every night and I do comedy. I know what's hack. If there's something in there that you think is hack, you either haven't got the joke or yes. you don't understand why it's in there. Yes. Uh, but don't, you know, I wouldn't presume to go into someone who it's a, <laughs> a doctor weird. in working for 30 years and go, would it be better if you, uh, <laughs> if you cured this disease? <laughs> you don't want to do it by like doing that. The, you know, but that's, <laughs> that's increasing now. That so it just seems to me counterintuitive. It shouldn't, you know, you find people you like and then take a chance with them. And that I think that's where all the, the great stuff is. You know, Monty Python, they seem to be just left to themselves. Yes. Armando Iannucci, leave him to himself and he'll come up with something great. Uh, I was talking to Mackenzie Crook on my podcast the other week, and, you know, with Detectorist, he just went Very in with this so. idea and they just yes. went, hey, we love this. Let's, you know, go and do it. We trust you to do it. And I think you sort of have to do that to, to create really groundbreaking good comedy. Let, let's go back to the beginning. I'm, okay. uh, I've been intrigued that you were you, you were born in Pocklington yeah. in Yorkshire. I was at school in Ampleforth, just 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 around the corner, How effectively. Yes, I was. Well, but I don't I, remember much about it. We left very early, but my dad was a teacher in uh, Pocklington. At school. Pocklington yeah, School. Yeah. And then you ended up at the school where he was headmaster. Yeah, but that was in Cheddar. So yeah, we, we, so we moved down. School. That was a comprehensive school in Cheddar, but a very nice school. Well, yeah, I, ended is, up. Is there, I know you've, you've, you've mused on this in the past yourself, but I, uh, if you have quite an anti-authoritarian streak... And your dad's a headmaster. It, it, you probably don't have to be Freud, <laughs> do you? Well, I think it's weird because I was, you know, I did the show Headmaster Son, which yes, was about exactly. trying to work out whether it affected me or not. And I think it definitely did affect me. Um, but I was at school. I was, you know, we, I was into comedy and I was into subversive comedy. But I was a very good. What sort of good, stuff? What, what? I loved like Pete and Dud and Monty Python, Young Ones. It was all that sort of stuff. So you know, and getting, and I was getting hold of a lot of the stuff on records. Like everyone else was listening to music. My friends yeah. were into punk, and I was a little bit into punk. But I was just, you know, a, a Pete and Dud thing dropped into your lap and, yes. you know, you couldn't believe. I don't know how I got away with listening to it at 13 or 14. No, the language. And, and, and how my parents Alone. obviously didn't know what was going on. appreciate and they were, it's a nice Pete and Dudley. He's got a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> so you left off, you know, doing this <laughs> stuff. So, you know, I loved all that stuff. So it was a subversive in terms of I loved comedy that was subversive. But I were, um, and I was naughty in that I was cheeky in lessons and trying to be funny all the time. There was a group of friends who had always trying to be funny and we did student comedy and student magazines that were again a little bit subversive but we were sort of really good as well and right. I, was, I was trying to get to university and I was clever and I was doing, getting good exam results but you, you already um, had the, the performer thing yeah I think so on. but I think all of it came all of it predates any, anything to do with my dad though so I think you know like I look at my I realised at about four or five I was kind of obsessed with you know this mysterious thing of sex without knowing too much about what it was, but have what even what I gleaned at five, I found was obsessed with it and nudity and swear, you know, saying poo and wee yes, and stuff, yes, which yes, my daughter's just getting into. But just like that was exciting to me. But I was also uh, really into funny anything that was funny. I loved, I loved writing stories. You know, it was all kind of in, innate in there. Really, I think it was inside me. And did you always know then that that it was potentially something you could do for a living? No, you? no. I think I wanted to, and that was the dream. You know, you watch these people and you dreamt that you could do that but like as a Somerset schoolboy with no grounding in showbiz I remember going to uh, my careers at officers meeting and you know him and saying well I'd like to be a writer or an actor and he's going well you know those aren't on the form you can't do those no you, can work, you should work in a bank <laughs> or you know or you're not going to be able to do it because it, it wasn't a realistic uh, avenue even then you know even when we started really you know it wasn't comedy wasn't something people went into as a living you know it was, no uh, there'd be a very few people who'd got tv shows and might be successful in that way but it wasn't like oh and now it is because it's such an industry and now people can go oh if i go into this i i could be michael McIntyre and earn a million pounds a night or whatever you know so i think that people look at it differently but they, and you know they don't, they don't who miss. were the trailblazers for you then who's inspired you because Badil's done this podcast yeah and, and um, he's slightly older than you. Yeah. And they, they, they kind of invented 
rock and roll comedy, yes, as it were. Yeah. So that presumably threw open some sort it of did. I mean, internal they, door. We were sort of just a couple of years behind yes. them and with the same management as them, and it wasn't. It was probably unhelpful to us because yeah, I think course. people just thought, oh, they're you know they're trying to. We weren't massive. I love David, and you know, I think he's. A, I'd seen his stand up, and you know I'd seen bits and pieces of Newman and Badil. Uh, and it was in pieces, wasn't it? But uh, sure. but uh, it was you know they weren't they weren't like a big influence on us. We I I was I think me and Stu came from very different sensibilities, but very similar sense of humours. How did you uh, meet? We met at university, so we were met in the first term at university, and I think again everyone else was we met sort of at the comedy club. They, we sort of missed each other a few times, and then we sort of met at a party, and we both sort of disliked everything else everyone was doing. <laughs> And we both had done quite weird things in the first term that right. we hadn't seen, but we'd heard of. And on stage, yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> only on stage, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. uh, and so he he'd done a sketch about people standing at a bus stop with fruit, and I, you know, all I'd heard was everyone going this weird sketch, and I'd done a sketch about having a singing penis. Uh, so it probably sums the two of us up. And we both kind of felt we had something, we had the same sense of humour, but a very different way of coming at it. And I think throughout everything we were doing, that was the case as well. In that. I was I had I I loved all those sort of sketch comedians. I loved the group comedy. I loved young the young ones, and but also you know I was very in. And you like collaborating? I did. I, you know, so it, it took me a long time to become a solo comedian because yes. I didn't think I had a kind of weird, awful time in Edinburgh when we went up. We were in the Oxford Review, and we went up in 1988, and it was just at the point where stand up comedy was massively in the ascendant. Student comedy was in the in the gutter, right. and they kicked us in the gutter. You did know, they basically. really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we had a horrible time, uh, and really sort of bullied. I understand why. By the audiences? No, by the other comedians, by right. the stand-up. The stand-up comedians, you know, hated the uh, perceived privilege and the fact that we'd all get on. And This is interesting, because, David, again, David Badil was saying that for, for that generation, which you're part of, five years previously, Footlights and the Oxford um, Review were, were pretty much golden tickets. Yeah. And five years later, they sort of became golden tickets again. A so bit, you're, yeah. you're jumping from Fry, f f Fry and Emma Thompson yeah. and Hugh Laurie to probably Robert Webb and David Mitchell. Yeah. Uh, and then in the middle, people who actually you were from quite a humble background. If your father was yeah. a comprehensive school headmaster, it's not like, you know, silver spoon territory. No. But you were perceived as being well. We represented, and I understand that we represented the past privilege of yes. you know. And it's I'm still, saying, you know, oh yeah, I'm, everyone. I think the pianist went to public school, but all the five performers in the in the show were from comprehensive schools. And yeah, and so you know, and, and that was it annoyed me because I felt like what you want to do is get to a point where the nice, the posh universities and the good universities are open to everyone. Sure. And so you don't want to have them perceived as being these privileged places. You want them to be perceived as a place where you can get to if you work hard, which, you know, we had to, all of, of us had to work yes. hard to get. And we're very proud to. to get there. And then, but then as a comedian, you sort of had to be ashamed of it. And Stu sort of sided with, you know, not sided with them, but he realised he wanted to do stand-up. And I was still, I was still pushing. I want to do sketches. You know, I believe okay. sketches. I, you know, I didn't like the stand ups because I didn't Why feel not? I was going to be. Well, uh, partly because of this experience. You know, I yeah. didn't think I was going to be accepted. I didn't feel like a solo performer. Um, and I always felt I did better with other people. And I was, you know, I did better in sketches. I was sort of perceived as the performer at university. I was in the Oxford Review. I did lots of acting. So that, it, that it just, and I, you know, I think a bit like David Mitchell. David Mitchell's never gone into doing stand up. He would no. be an amazing stand up if he wanted to do it. But I think he. It was a it, it's a baptism of fire stand up you know it's a difficult thing to do and especially coming from a different background I did stand up for two or three years so you can hide behind a singing penis yeah or a sketch or... <laughs> and yeah or an accent or a character and I was okay. when I did stand up to begin with I was sort of veering between characters and myself right. and trying to please myself and trying to please the people who were booking and I never quite sometimes I do well sometimes I do really badly and then you know the the double act stuff started taking off and the writing started taking off so I kind of dumped the the stand up were you analysing it to this degree at the time yeah yeah no, really it's, yeah. It was, quite very, it was rare. Well, we were very, you know, we were very into. I was just into comedy in a way that other, and I'm not into music. I, right. I listen to music now, and I enjoy music more than I used to. But it didn't. I, I sort of disliked music because I felt it. I mean, I suppose comedy does well, and any taste in anything does. But it, it, it seemed to me to divide people. You know, someone would say, "I like Phil Collins, yeah, yeah. and I like the Sex Pistols, so we can never be friends." Yes, and you kind yes. of go, "That's." I mean, it possibly is a good way of discovering whether whether you're, you're compatible, but also, you know, it seemed weird as a, the way that cliques were formed at school, and I kind of didn't like that. Though I'm sure, you know, I would probably have been as snotty as if someone had said they liked uh, Last of the Summer Wine <laughs> in an unlikely event. Uh, you know, I would have said, well, I like the young ones. Um, it was good. Were you, were you, so so the, it almost like you had a plan already, 
or not? I mean, I think a little bit. We sort of, I, you know, I'd read this book from Fringe to Flying Circus, so all my heroes were Monty Python and you know Rowan Atkinson, and you know yes. to let uh, to it, not in this book, but the young ones they'd been, gone to Manchester, but all these people had gone to university, done student comedy, and then. Yeah. gone to London and done stuff so, so I had there was a part I had that plan but I went to university thinking oh, there's no way you know I was just thinking the Oxford view it's this you know Michael Palin Terry Jones yeah, yeah. Ronax and it's this revered thing I'll never get in um and it's you know it is so fragile because like I, I remember doing I did that singing penis sketch at the the fortnightly club and the <laughs> and the I remember just some of the other comedians from the year above sitting in the front row going oh well, you know I could hear them commenting on it you know going, what's oh. this oh well what's all this about you know and you just think it's so fragile because if that had just broken and everyone, oh, that's that terrible guy who does that terrible singing penis thing. Yes. Uh, but because it kind of resonated with some other people, it was okay. Uh, and yeah, and we sort of just suddenly were, did really well, you know. So we went, we went, we formed this little sketch troupe together and it, it, we sort of did the weekly shows, which we were very lucky had just started up this fortnightly shows. And every week we sort of stormed it with a new, we'd write new material every week. Uh, and we'd write four or five sketches, and then we sort of they, we nearly became the Oxford Review that year, and then said they gave us a, a separate show at right. lunchtime, which was a bit of a sort of damp squib. Sure. But it meant then we went back to university the next term, and we went direct from the Edinburgh Fringe, boom, and we just were this phenomenon. It was like insane, you know. So they, no one it was, was it only called? it was called the we called the Seven Raymonds. We were called because it was the idea that like it. You know, the two Ronnies had got together, yeah. but there were seven people called Raymond and they'd all got together. <laughs> but like no one was called Raymond and there were six of us. So it was all, it was loads of terrible jokes in there. But um, you rocked it. But it just went insane, you know. And so we were just the stars of the Seriously. university scene. Yeah, yeah. For, it was, we did, it was like, I guess, in a tiny, like, hundred seat room probably. But we did five nights and it just sold out and it was standing, you know, people standing and going. So you were sort of famous on yeah, campus. Or yeah, I mean, college. just very quickly, you know, in that, I mean, it sort of built quite quickly in that, you know, the couple of terms before we went away. But when we came back from, because none of the freshers knew that that meant nothing that we'd been to the Edinburgh Fringe so and we've been to the Edinburgh Fringe and five people had seen us every morning every lunchtime but you're back as conquering heroes yeah yeah and so you know so it was so we had this great you know we had a lovely time where we had three years to experiment with comedy and there was a little bit of a taste of the real world that year I went to Edinburgh yeah. and got kicked kicked down and nearly you know nearly gave up to be honest it was so bad what would you have done if you had I presume I'd have been a teacher because that's what everyone else, and near everyone else in my family's a teacher. And you know, it's, there's similarities. Of course there are. <laughs> but, uh, of course there are. Uh, but I'm glad, you know, I'm glad I, had, I didn't go that way. So when did you first get handed a, a, a packet of cash? Or a- well, I remember we got paid quite quickly for doing like a just the we did it the five of us at college and we got fifty quid, so we got ten pounds each. And I genuinely couldn't believe. It was like probably within a couple of months of us forming this group, we had to do half an hour of comedy and they gave me £10. And I just, I nearly framed it, genuinely. I didn't spend it because I didn't have any money. And then, you know, I think like in Edinburgh, we got like invited to play in a bar. And it was a similar sort of thing. Yeah. Like we came to sketches in a bar and like at lunchtime in a pub doing stupid student sketches. And, uh, you know, again, they gave us free food and £10 each or something like that. And I just couldn't, it just was unbelievable. So that was the idea that anyone would pay us for doing this was was insane. But yeah, that came quite quite quickly in those terms. So as a student, that was quite helpful. Yeah. If, you know, every weekend you were earning a little bit of a little bit of money, um, but it was mainly doing free free gigs. And, and then as as graduation approaches, and you, you are obviously you've decided to give. I mean, together you decided you and Stuart yeah, I mean, decided I think, together we'll try and. I mean, Stuart different was, world now, isn't it? For younger people listening yeah. to this, the idea that you could have actually given yourself a year or two to see if it happened yeah, or yeah. not, they will find very hard to believe. Well, listen, they and come to London, can't eat if they. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we say let's go to London and yes. live in like in the cheapest place we can live and have no money and eat yes. baked potatoes. But even so, you know, my rent was. And you'd shed the other Raymonds by this point. Yeah, they were. They was. They're all our friends, but they they weren't. We weren't working together. Um, but yeah, me and Stu came and we shared a flat with. Uh, well, actually, one of the other Raymonds was yes. in the was in the house. It was in Acton, um, and I think we paid sixty pounds a week each for you know, like a room in this house. So you know that was achievable. And there were things like enterprise. Allow- I got on the enterprise allowance quite quickly, and that paid your that basically paid you forty pounds a week and anything you earned you could keep. And I yeah. think you still got your house, your, your money for your rent. So I had a couple of years where you really helped it through. Mm. But yeah, we just I basically decided let's do five years and see where we are in five years. What did your dad think? They were quite supportive, but I think because my brother's a bit older than me and he's about six years older than me, and he'd really wanted to be quite a serious writer, you know, yeah. he's quite a poet, and they'd sort of dissuaded him from doing it because they wanted him to settle down and be of sensible. Course. And uh, and then it didn't, that made him more upset, obviously. And I think they realised that you just got to let them see what happens, you know, yes. let people have a go and stuff. Yes. And I think being the younger one, it just helped, it just helped out having that 
you know a bit more freedom you're not quite you're not quite as uh, responsible are you when you're the youngest one so they, they and just and also just at being a bit you know being it being the 1980s rather than the 1970s I think it made a difference yeah. the world had moved on a little bit and it felt like this wasn't a ridiculous they were they were nervous about it I think sure but they felt it was achievable yeah I mean, they so they'd they, they, seen your stuff and they thought you were quite good as well <laughs> they'd right? seen it <laughs> and uh, I don't know they thought it was good but I think they I think they just realised I wanted to do it and they were going to let me you know and they were supportive and they they you know they when I bought my first flat again when, when it was possible to do yeah. I was we were just we were just about to do a TV series so I knew I could pay them back but they lent me ten grand right we weren't I mean we weren't even get we weren't getting paid very much for the TV series but I knew I could pay them back pretty sure. quickly um, and so that just that was just my down that was my deposit on the flat imagine being able to put ten thousand pounds down on a flat and then still right. be able to afford a mortgage um, so you know it was they were yeah they did they were I, like, I like the idea that they had faith in you though that's nice There's yeah a, I saw Nigel Haver speaking recently about Jack Whitehall right he's his godfather right and he went to see him above a pub in Hampstead or yeah. something shortly after he left school I think you might have to find something else. <laughs> <laughs> not sure, not sure this is going to work for you, Jacko. <laughs> so you do. It take, takes a little bit of confidence. And when you and Stuart started, I mean, we you did the normal circuit, presumably. Yeah, we did the standard circuit, and like Stuart, you know. So I we, again coming at it from slightly different angles. I yeah. knew all about like the Radio Four and uh, weekending. And so one of my brother's friend at school coincidentally had been through all the weekending thing, and I think wasn't doing it anymore. But I knew all that existed. Um, and Stewart really kind of got to grips with what, where the stand-up circuit was, and was very—I mean, was—he was just focused on that. Really, the, the, the stuff we did together was like a sideline. Oh, okay. <clears throat> he always wanted to be, you know, to do what he's doing now, which is which is good. But you know, he was always working along parallel. I yes. was I was really pushing everything into the right. double act through the nineties, which made the kind of transition a little bit difficult, tougher for you. Yeah, because I didn't really have any. I, you know, I I was the. Why part do you of the think double that act. was? Because I decided to be the part of a double act, but the, what I did in the double act wouldn't work outside of. Yeah, but but also personality wise, why do you think that? Um, was? Well, you know, he was very. He was. He's very. Um, Driven in himself, and he well, and you're he, not and coming he, across as lackadaisical yourself. No, I'm not. <laughs> but I, but I, I, I am much more of a. You know, I, I, I like the idea of comedy as a community and doing yes. stuff with other people. And he was, and and you know, and a lot of stand-ups are, are, are entirely autonomous and can't of work course. with other people. And Stu can work with other people, and is, you know, is giving and all those sort of things. But he, but he, you know, he knew what he wanted, and what he really wanted was to be what he is now, which is fantastic. And and, and everybody has a sort of yeah. favorite gear. Yeah. Yours is different yes. from his. Yeah. So, you know, it was it was so because I'd invested everything in the double eight was when we stopped doing the double eight, it was it was like a couple of years of oh, you know the slow down. What what does, we've only just we've only just got what, the double eight off the ground. Yeah, but where do I go? Yeah. So don't <laughs> want to start. Um So then you started collaborating with people like Chris Morris, you worked on On the Hour. Yeah. Were you working on that together, you and Stuart? Me and Stuart were yeah, we wrote so about you worked as a you wrote as a double. Yeah, as a we pair. Yeah, so we wrote we went we we were doing the stand up circuit separately. Right, and we were going to the radio for and writing for Weekending, which we neither of us really liked, but we it was a good place to meet producers. Yes, of course. And well, we why met. didn't you like it because it's a bit production line? Well, it was just not our sense of humour, and it was you know it's quite this, arch, yeah, news, yeah. news based, very, yeah, and very... just um, a bit, you know, and a bit hack. It was uh, generally okay. a bit like you know we did when we did on the hour, we wrote a sketch about someone it, going to a Weekending style, course, yes, of thing, course. And, you don't and, register, do you? But that is in many ways, it's <laughs> taking the piss out yeah. of precisely. Yeah. The things you've just said about weekend. So, but, but we did weekending, and it was really good to do it because a it it was a way of you had to write stuff quickly, you had to write things succinctly, you had to get you know you had best chance to get a twenty second sketch on that wasn't our yeah, yeah, yeah. natural thing. You know we like to write ten minute sketches, but they were never going to get onto onto weekending. Uh, and then it also gave you an idea. You know you would have a one producer would come on and use. Well, one we had Harry Thompson uh, who, di- who did it one week, and he used twelve minutes of material from me and Stuart, which was unheard of. Like this big room of writers, and we wrote over half the show, right. <laughs> and that was insane. But that had followed eight weeks with Diane Messias as a producer, who'd used one twenty-second sketch. Still remember the name? Yep. Uh, and, <laughs> so you know, but that was a that was a difficult eight weeks because yeah, I was relying a lot on that. You know, and you only get, get paid for what's used. Yeah, you only get well, we get you kind get, of you get twenty pound commission if you got to be a commissioned writer. So you got one minute maybe. Right. We might have had to split that. It might be twenty pounds each, but every every minute we got extra, we'd get twenty pounds between the two of us. Gosh. So yes. you know, it, it was the, the, it was between what you got to eat or drink at yeah, the end yeah, of the week. Yeah. Um. So, but you know, we met. Um, I mean, we, Armando did it, and we did know Armando. What we was met. he there as a producer? He was a producer, yeah. Okay. So he went. We've known he's, him. he's done this as well, and quite unintentionally. There've been quite a lot of um, dovetailing. Yeah. In all of the unfiltered, not all of it, obviously. <laughs> you, you probably haven't got much in common with the female genitalia. <laughs> 
genital mutilation campaign in Nimco Alley. Although if we <laughs> keep talking for long enough, we'll find some connections. Because he felt, and this has been a little bit missing from what you've told me so far, he kind of felt almost blessed that he suddenly, after coming down from Scotland, found himself working at BBC London, it would have been, with um, Steve Coogan and Chris Morris yeah. and people like that. Whereas... With you, there's more of a sense of it being the result of effort rather than a kind of magic wand moment. You, you, you seem yeah, to have... I mean, we, we all happen pretty fast, you know. So we, you know, the the, I mean, all the things that those stand-up comedians said about Oxford, sort of, is slightly true. We, yes. you know, we met Armando and Sarah Smith, who did our producing for a few, a few years. We didn't really know her at Oxford. She was a bit sure. a couple of years ahead of us, but you know, I don't think that hurt. No. But actually, what the thing that cemented us to them was doing week both of them did weekending and both of them really liked what we were writing for weekending so Got it wasn't you. actually sure. you know we probably came from a similar sensibility which doesn't yes. you know which is the reason show business is how it is yes. and maybe it all changed uh, but um, you know Armando produced weekending and we really fitted in with what he was trying to do and so he said you know I'm doing this other show that's which he even tried doing a little bit in weekending he tried to make weekending a bit different and it, you know to an extent succeeded uh, and he said will you come and help on this other show and he I mean Armando is you know that's where his genius was he spotted all the people he spotted for that show yeah. have gone on to be it's in some way for not, it? yeah. it's, it's and he was unbelievable and he was you know pretty much the first person to spot it so even Steve Coogan Steve had done a bit of telly and he'd been yeah. doing you know he was just doing a WH Smith advert where he was doing Frank Spencer and that's all that right. sort of stuff and spitting image voices yeah spitting well, image yeah. voices of course so he was you know he was rich and well you know he was, right. doing, he was when, when we worked well yeah. when we worked with him You'd go to his flat and there'd be checks lying around that he hadn't sent to the bank, you know. And me and Stuart, but were going, he'd left those out <laughs> just before, just before you arrived. He'd run around putting them yeah, on the sideboard. Yeah. You go, but this is from five months ago. You know, me and I oh know, especially me, because Stuart was earning a bit of money from stand up. I was earning a bit of pittance from yeah. writing for the radio, and so seeing someone, you know, he was making advert money, sure, he was making TV money, money. Was big, but especially it then was, as well, yeah, it yeah, was really yeah, astonishing. But he was doing very main, you know, and yes. speaking images a bit less so. But he was doing. He could easily have gone Bobby Davro, yeah, okay, or Michael Barron. More. Yeah, uh, but Armando saw him and spotted something. Oh, I didn't know that. Bigger in the, yeah. than that, and you know, put him in on the air. And Chris Morris again. It's not a difficult thing to spot what Chris Morris was doing at Radio Bristol was interesting and great. But Armando said, "Yes, that will work in this framework." He's like an I'm alchemist, doing. isn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. And then you know, but then Rebecca Front, Dune McEakin, um, David Schneider. I mean, all these people, and, the, and Stephen Wells was one of the writers. David Quantic was one of the writers. You know, all these people who were, and you know, it was me and Stu's first main job. Um, and so, yeah, it's this incredible Patrick Marber as well. I can't, mustn't forget him. Is, uh, is, it, is and... it true that you still dispute the origin of Peter O'Hanra? Oh, well, Han, 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 Han. that's definitely true. I mean, that was with so, Patrick so, Marber. You so, both claim. Well, what it. happened? Well, that was interesting, and that was because we ended up splitting from on the hour when it went to day day, and it was massive for me because this was we were about to get like a thirteen, and I remember it was a thirteen minute TV commission between the two of us. So six minutes of TV each, and I can't remember what the figure was, but yeah. you know, it wasn't twenty pounds a minute. Sure. So this was this was life-changing money yes. for me and also I knew that this show was going to be Monty Python of the 1990s you know you knew that this was it um, and we got into a sort of dispute for a manager as, uh, about ownership of characters uh, and whether we would be you know yeah and so if it, and he was right and he was like they were all so keen to go to the BBC they weren't deciding who owned what and blah sure. blah blah and so like if our manager had got his way and we'd been in that show and part of that deal had been you own 1% of Alan Partridge yeah. then the rest of my life would have been very different and not necessarily in a good way but he was sure. right to make those dis he was right to make that distinction but it was a massive I don't understand why you had to separate though well, because, because you and Stuart because had got we, they, offer they wouldn't give us ownership of the characters we felt we'd co-created and it was partly because On the Hours I mean it's convoluted On the Hours oh, written interested. in a way where we we would come up with ideas and then the cast would go and improvise them. Oh, I see. So who actually came up with so, that? So, yeah. So the Peter O'Hanran is... You'd be is, nothing is, without me. Well, it, you'd be nothing without yeah, well, me. Yeah, Peter O'Hanran's very Peter uh, interesting. Hanran. And it's, it's a very um, Lee and Herring yes. premise. Yes, uh, it is. Uh, and what I, I can tell you how it started, uh, that, where it came from. Is it still disputed? I, was, I, was, I don't think anyone would dispute this, but this, is why, this, this story shows where it's interesting. I was in bed... Listen to Radio 4 yes. on the morning the Maastricht Treaty was printed. Blimey, yeah. And 
it was the morning the Maastricht Treaty of this massive thing. Yeah. And the Radio 4 said to the reporter, so what's in the Maastricht Treaty? And this guy goes, well... <laughs> and he does, he does the whole thing. 297 pages. Yeah. And he's, try, <laughs> he's trying to... Uh, he's trying to get his way through this. So I went into the office and I said, this is brilliant. The, the, you know, a, a thing where the reporter yeah, clearly yeah, doesn't yeah. know anything about it and has to completely waffle his way through it and blah, blah, blah. And, and gets challenged and still has to fight. And they went, great. And then they went away and improvised that. I know it might have even about, been about the Master Treat, the first one. And it was on pick of the. It was picked out of the show, and it was on pick of the week. And I thought, I heard it went and brilliant. And they said that sketch written by Amanda Yanucci and Patrick Marva. And I kind of went in the next day and said, um, you know, why was I why was I not given a credit on the yeah. thing? And I said, well, you just heard it on the radio. And you kind of go, that is the entire premise yeah. of this entire thing. So it wasn't in any way. Um, you know, everyone was working so hard at it. It didn't, didn't matter. And it really didn't matter at that stage. But that was sort of, that Sound was precedent. basically the seed that was okay. going to grow. You know, and I remember thinking, well, that's a bit rich and it's a bit unfair. And like, it became like they were going away and getting winning writing awards for it. And someone would go, oh, well done on your, you know, we meet a producer and they go, well done. On, you know what? Congratulations. You're a bit you younger were, than them. A little, a little bit. bit, yeah. And, and you know, if we, you'd been on, if you'd been on the performing roster rather than just the writing roster, would you have processed it differently? I think it would have been a different thing. So what was quite interesting about it was that um, Patrick in the first series was Patrick Marvel wasn't writing any of it and was just a, was one of the performers. And then he in the second series he wanted to write stuff, and it was almost like a little joke amongst the writers that he was coming in and doing substandard versions of everything right. we were doing. Right. Um, but then he said, "Let's why don't we go to Edinburgh and do a stand up, show, do a sketch show together? Try and do this was the week of what you know, try and do, mm. try and be that yeah. um, you know the, Peter Cook, the Beyond the Fringe. Let's try and be the night and nights Beyond the Fringe. So it's Steve Coogan, Patrick Marber." And me and Stu, and also Simon Munnery, who we all really liked. And we were going to write... But it became apparent that Patrick had asked us to do it so that we would write loads of funny stuff for them. And and because of that imbalance, because we were the writers and they were the performers, and they perceived us themselves as the performers of On The Air and us as the writers on the air, if we were trying to pitch stuff to be in it ourselves. And, and it was that was a tough room to be. Yes, of course. When they're handing out the parts and go, yes. who wants to play this Steve Coogan or Richard Herring? You kind of go... Oh, yeah, well, I'd on, like man. to play. <laughs> but, yeah, Steve probably would do it better. Uh, so, you know, that was difficult. But it, 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 we had this, it, it, again, that was, I think, part of the problem. We had this very difficult Edinburgh together where that should have been an amazing show. Yes. Um, and nearly was. Sure. No, one, no one came to see it. It was the year Steve won the Perrier with his other show that Patrick directed. Um, and, you know, we were getting no one come to see it and we were infighting and it was just sort of weird. And then, but in the last week, a producer came, Peter Kessler came and said, oh, I love this. We'd love to put this on the telly. And suddenly, Patrick was like 100% behind you. Know? So Patrick had this, um, he, he was more ambitious or, or more brazenly ambitious than everyone else. I'm yes. sure we were all as ambitious, but he was just, you could see him, you could see the, it cogitating <laughs> and you could see where he was forming alliances. And it, so the, it was weird for us when, you know, in the end, Patrick ended up owning 50% of Alan Partridge. And, right. 100% of some of Steve's characters. I think Steve felt in awe of this, slightly yes. in awe of this Oxbridge thing and and didn't realise that he, in many ways, was the genius behind all of what he does. Of course. And so he wanted these people to help him out and then was very generous, in fact, with the people who did go on to co-create the stuff in, in, in kind of giving them ownership. But not you. you but didn't. we, because we, you know, it was the wrong point. But, you know, yeah, clearly. But... Again, you know, I, I look at all the things, all those points in your career where you go, yeah, of course. what if I'd walked, you know, I could have walked yeah, away yeah. from Avalon and Stuart. I could yeah. have said, I wanted to do it and I didn't agree. I sort of, I, I said, it's more important we're in it. And they, my manager and Stu said, no, no, it's more important we own the characters. Oh, really? Is that right? And, and I could have walked away. I could have said, well, I'll leave. I'll stay with them. I'll stay with them and goodbye, Avalon, goodbye. Did you, did, I mean, did you, did you have sort of sleepless nights over I thought or? about it but I, you know I kind of you know I had loyalty to Stu but I also thought we had something interesting together right. but had we gone on to write on the hour you know Peter Bainham took our place who's a friend of ours and who I'm interviewing tonight yeah. and uh, he you know when they had a photo of the cast there wasn't Peter Bainham in the end typing you know he wasn't and yeah. he's gone on to get lots of stuff out of having done that so job. So he got on, on screen as well, didn't he? He did a little bit, but not, you know, but hardly. So, it's you know, I think if we'd been the writers and it might it would have been a different life and it may have yeah. been a wonderful life, but, um, I would have been I would have been writing for yeah. some incarnation of Alan Partridge or, you know, sure. it would have been interesting and it would have been But you had lucrative. that thing inside you that wanted to I just perform. Think it, yeah. Because Robert Webb spoke to us about this and, and they got to sort of nearly 30 mm. and the writing was paying the mortgage and they were... 
making yeah. their way. But he said that was the point at which I began to wonder whether the performing would ever happen. Yeah. And if it hadn't happened, it, you know, like you just said, I yeah. could still have had a perfectly fulfilling, exactly. and successful career, but it wouldn't have been this career. Well, it just, there's so, you know, the, the older you get and the more you look at stuff, you become so much more philosophical about everything. Yes, and do. like, and you just go, hey, well, I'm glad this happened because it led to this. Yeah. And I w- this wouldn't have happened. You know, you wouldn't be with, I wouldn't have the children I have, and I wouldn't have the no, wife I have. No, I know. All I those know, things. So you're glad about the, all, all of that part. But also, I, I wouldn't be having the career I have now, and I wouldn't have wanted the career I have now. If I'd been given the toss up, tw- even probably twenty years or fifteen years ago, they said, "Do you want to be uh, David Mitchell or do you want to be a bloke making his own stuff on the yes. internet?" I'd have said, "I want to be David Mitchell, please." <laughs> uh, but now I would rather be me. Yes, of course. So it's and and that that's sort of interesting. It's so weird how much you put on stuff, isn't it, when you're young? That yeah. idea that I used to do this thing where um, I, I, I'd look at women getting jobs, and I'd be jealous. Right. And now I sort of look back and think. Hey, you were never going to get a job if they were looking for it. The Sky did a thing once where they'd just done the 3am girls in the Daily Mirror and yeah. they said, we want to do a news version of that. Do you know any women? And I said, well, yeah, but can I try out for it? And this is mid-twenties. It's a tough period, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. And you kind of, also, I think you feel that if it doesn't happen now, it might never happen. Yeah, yeah. So you'd got over that hump. You were actually weighing up different options. You yeah. weren't thinking, if this doesn't, I'm back measuring inside legs on Regent Street by the end of next week, which would have been my right. thing. And you do, as you, as you get older, you do begin to look over things. You think, what were you thinking of? Yeah, well, you know, you're driven and, you know, I'm sure, we were, we, like, like I say, we were all ambitious, really, in that of way course. that Patrick was and that we mocked him probably for yeah. the time. And we, but we were all, it was only, here, you know, it was more apparent with him. And, uh, you know, and there, there are then those moments and, and some of them are betrayals and some of them aren't. They feel yeah. like betrayals. And but it's actually, all part they, of the you know, journey. Someone's been given an opportunity and, you know, they have to make a choice. So what was the first thing that kicked off after you'd walked away from On The Arrow? Would it have been... Um would it have been Fist of Fun? Or I mean, sort it? of. So we were, all this time we were also working up... Uh, so on the hour, we'd started working on uh, a radio show called uh, Lionel Nimrod's Inexplicable World. And I think we'd done a couple of other bits and pieces as well. So there were little things coming up. So, yeah, the, our own little radio uh, career was going OK. And so we did Fist of Fun. For Radio 1, people... Yeah, so we did Fist... We did li- I'm trying to think. Yeah, Fist... We did Lionel Nimrod, and it was Radio 4. And then Radio 1 played... Put bits. some of them on okay. late night. Uh, and then Radio 1 suddenly decided they wanted to do late night comedy and so again incredibly lucky to be in that position Uh, Chris Morris did the show Armando did a show uh, the Ginger Prince. Do you remember the Ginger Prince? I can't remember what they were called now. But some of there was another sort of <laughs> trendy, slightly comedy show. Uh, and um, uh, we when we did first of all Fist of Fun, which was like a tour show doing sketches around universities, and then the Lee and Herring show, which was like a studio based DJ show. But we did we cut to sketches, but yeah. we also took calls, and you know it was live. So just incredibly fortunate again to de- and again to de- get several hours of this. Quite exposed show. though, if you if you muff up that kind of, I mean. Live is, is yeah. Quiet. I mean, I don't think we ever really thought. I mean, we did make mistakes. I remember one time that I, I had the ha- headphones on wrong, and I was looking at the <laughs> clock, uh, and I didn't know that the. I thought the producer's voice came in either headphone. No one had told, so I had one headphone on. I think and I was looking at the clock, and the second hand was coming out, and no one seemed to be going. You know, and I was going, and now we must go over to Manchester for Mark Radcliffe. And everyone else was looking at me going, what are you doing? And then, and yeah. then the cut, and I said, well, no, we've got to go, we've got to, and I couldn't understand why they hadn't cut. And then I, the producer had been saying, hey, there's end. another minute, you've got the, you know, you've misread the clock. And so there was just this awful eggy, and I was, and I was very self-conscious, I was very embarrassed, and I kind of stormed off in a huff because I couldn't stand the embarrassment. <laughs> of, because it had been, you know, I was going, I didn't know that, you know, I thought it came out both ears, the producer's voice. <laughs> and she was going, everyone knows it only comes out one ear, which he didn't know. Uh, and <laughs> so, you know, but those moments are funny but yeah we do, I think we, we there's that mixture I was so self-conscious and scared but also just had See, this, that first time overwhelming you that. Every, the impression we're just over halfway and that's the first sign of vulnerability that you've yeah. even shown and, and it's odd that because well I was very insecure because of this whole I think you a lot, kept doing a lot of, things uh, this is the weird mixture between yeah. the, 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 the look at me gene and the insecurity yeah, yeah, isn't it because you, you kind of keep doing things that expose you to possible humiliation yeah. on quite a large stage yeah I mean that's comedy though. I mean that is, is the, that is the irony of the stand-up comedian, yes. you know. And some of them aren't. Some some stand-up comedians are the same on and off stage. But mostly there's a lot of, you know, nobody's quite that heightened. And if they are that heightened off stage, then you don't want to hang around with them. But yeah, there's a massive insecurity, and there has to be because if you, I, I don't know, there are different types of comedians. Because there are, I was talking about this as well. There's very confident comedians, yeah. and they're often either the, the absolute best or the absolute worst. Yes, yes. So the absolute worst open spots 
just believe they are the best. They go on, they die, they believe they've done they amazingly well. They're the best. They still, after, oh, but they don't even dying. notice they've died. Yeah. Um, it's almost enviable, isn't yeah, it? That it's sort scum. of is, but then it's, and I would, and when Stu had it to an extent, so I would watch Stu and he'd come off and go, I was the best on tonight, I went the best, and you kind of go, objectively, you were the best, but you weren't, the, the audience yeah. didn't think you were. Top three, uh, top three. <laughs> and, you know, but he believed it, and that was enough to push you, push you yeah. on, and he was very good. Uh, but equally, you know, someone will go on, and, and, and I, I was, I was, I would always beat myself up about mistakes right. and, and Stu would always beat me up about my mistakes as well but not his and not, own, not his own. Uh, he'd always apologise for me and never for himself so it was it was that kind of big brother yeah, yeah, yeah. big brother little brother relationship and he didn't have siblings and I think he kind of didn't you know quite get how that worked give um, and take compromise yeah yeah 50-50 yeah. uh, and uh so yeah, so it, it it I was you know I think I've been really shaken. I think if I hadn't had that experience in Edinburgh, I was about to I say would, that I don't think I'd have been as shaken as I was. But really I was well. really sh- I was very confident and doing lots of plays and lots of acting at university, and then that got taken out of me. I was doing that dumb show thing with Patrick Marby, who was telling me I couldn't act, and so I was lo- all the time losing this confidence. Yeah. But then yeah, still managing to go on and do things. Lost yourself down, yeah, and, go, and just go and out push and yourself. It. But I. I you know, Stu, Stu was doing loads of stand-up and was telling... And when we were doing the double act, he was going, look, I've done all this stand-up, you don't know what you're doing. I've done this much more. And I had to go to him, I've done exactly as much being in a double act as you have, yes, so I exactly. know exactly as much. It's, an, it's a very different dynamic. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah. completely different yeah. thing. So... Then it was this morning with Richard, not Judy, was it? We yeah, we did. Fist, we did fist fast. of fun on. We did the fist of fun on the radio. Then we did fist of fun on the TV with two series. So we yeah. had one. We had a, a series where. We, so you're famous now, are you, Richard? Well, um, no. Of... I mean, it's it was we, it never really. I, it never took off in that way. With it never took off in that Newman and Medea way. Right. Um, we would tour and eighty people might come. So we'd be in a big theatre, but eighty people would come and see Seriously? us. Seriously. Yeah, and occasionally it'd be a couple hundred, and once it was eight hundred places right. in Brighton. To make sorry towards the probably towards the end of the you know, stuff. Uh, so you know we it didn't. I think a lot of people were watching it, but a lot of them, the ones who liked it, were probably thirteen and not able to come out. <laughs> So, which I think, but that was me. That was me at thirteen. I was, you know, I wouldn't have been able to go and see Monty Python, even if they'd gone to Western Superman. No, of I wouldn't, course wouldn't have, not. Wouldn't have been allowed to go. So it's. Um, Were you lonely at this time? I, mean, I was. Cause... Yeah, I was. I, I was because I was just. I found it difficult to cope with, and I and I and I um, I wasn't great at. Foisting, I was always worried about foisting yourself on other people. Yes. So I'd spend a lot of time just at my in my own on my yeah. <laughs> in my flat, uh, and I did. We had friends, and we did have a, an amazing time, and sure. there was gr- great stuff going on. But there was a lot of time on a Friday and Saturday where I'd go, "Oh God, I haven't arranged to do anything, and it's too late to ring anyone now because yeah. they'll all have arranged everything." Yeah. And I think that's where, and everyone was probably the same, or men, many people were the same. Yes. It was before the internet where you could have gone, "Oh, you, you know, you tweet." Yeah, it was a bit of a production yeah. to get stuff. Together. So you know, you you could have just seen someone else on Twitter and gone oh yeah. Yeah, do you want to have a drink uh, but um, but yeah so it's it was I, it was difficult because it was we were working very intensely and so I think me and Stu were friends and then we were just in each other's pockets so you 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 know we would go out drinking for a bit and then sure. just wanted to get away from yes, each other um, and uh, but then we would mainly the main people that each other knew but then he was doing stand up and knew more comedians and stuff was so, that yeah. gap getting bigger then were you more and more conscious of the fact that he had two careers and you only had one um a little bit and i just you know i think he you know he had he never really had he had a little bit more disdain for our stuff i think you know because he hadn't written it all he was had that kind of confidence that okay that in himself so some of my things he didn't like generally if we didn't both like something we wouldn't do it mm. um and so we you know he would do it in his own thing or right. you know i'd save it up for something else yes. Uh, but you know, I was do- I was doing more of the legwork in the writing. I was doing all the editing of all the radio stuff. I was you know script editing it. I was. I can't I, I can't work out how much of you is is front of house and how much of you is back stage. In right. Per- in percentage terms, I can't work out how much of you is front and center and how much of you is writing it and putting it well, together like, and helping know, other people. I think like with with Leon Herring because he was he had, he had well, I distractions. Mean, Leon, I mean just you. I mean, well, how, how much of you is I mean is the performer and how oh, much it, of I you think is increased, the craftsman? Increasingly um well, it's difficult to yeah. say. Yeah, and it's changed things. in the yeah, course yeah. of your career, hasn't yeah. it? You've, I mean, you've... increasingly I'm more myself on stage, so that's a different thing. But it's thing. taken a long time. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's, you know, and that's why I'm lucky. Yes. No most people don't, you know, most people don't get the opportunity to do 13 one man shows no well with that without either being coming really successful or uh, being told to yes, go away of course so, no because so, you so, need that weird apprenticeship yeah, with yeah. lots of different so strands I've done, and... you know so i've got very very good at doing stand up but i'm not really on anyone's 
rate, you know, the people who, luckily, people know I'm there and they'll come and see me. And I'm almost, you know, I'm still amazed if 250 people come see me in a little town. Yeah. I'm going, where the hell have these people come from? What, where do they know me from? And why they keep coming back, you know, because you still don't believe in yourself that much. But it's when you think, actually, you know, there's 500 people in here tonight. There's 100 people and in here tonight. And they've had a good time. You know, but they've had a nice time and they've come back. Yes. So pe- that's, that's a all big, you need. It's a big thing to, sure. to give up a night, to give up, yeah. you know, 30, 40 quid. Yeah. Uh, and especially as a parent, you suddenly realise, you know, those precious absolutely. nights off. Yes, if you've made that decision to go and see someone, A, it makes me think, I've got to give them a, an amazing time, which 10 years ago, sometimes I think I'm going to deliberately annoy them tonight and make them uncomfortable. I wouldn't do that now because I think, look, Christ, this might be your one night a month where you're having a nice time with yeah, your partner. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and yeah, I just, want you to have a really good just, time. Seriously. So, so uh, you know, you really appreciate that. So when you um, went your separate ways... That was that a kind of conscious? Was it like a divorce? It was. Well, it was. It was foisted on us because we were doing. You know, if they'd given us another series, we would have done another series. Right. I'm not sure we'd have done many more series. Uh, but they've been double acts that that's yeah. happened to. They've had that break, and they were about to stop working with each other, and then they're forced to work together yeah. for a yeah, long, no, long like time. You know, semi- and then they're very successful, and sure. and then. And I'm glad it didn't happen to us, really. I genuinely am. I'm glad we had that time together. I, it, it was, it, you know, mainly I look back and with happy memories, there's bad things in there. Um, and weirdly, I think with this morning, if you watch them, the first one, people are just flabbergasted by yes. it's almost silent. Yes. The last one is just Very like, the everyone gets it. And we're just getting to the point where newspapers start and go, hey, there's this amazing show. It was such a weird thing. You know, I wanted to do this slot. I loved Saturday morning TV yeah. like Tiz was and the banana splits and all this yeah. stuff I want that kind of and I want it was my idea to do this slot uh, of Sunday live on Sunday lunchtime we did it live because we'd hated all the effort we had to do with Fist of Fun where it took four hours to record edit 30 and minutes cut and cut and well just redo it redo it redo it and you thought again, well let's do, do it again. Stu wasn't keen, that keen on doing it live but I really wanted to do it live very very different uh, forces aren't they yeah, completely yeah. different yeah, yeah. And, and it just meant we'd done it and it was great you know And but it was it was this amazing thing, but it was on at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm. And, and then the repeat kept on getting moved around, so people weren't really able to get into it. But people had got into it, and again, it was the regime change. The new controller came in, and she stayed for a long time, and she didn't get it at all and didn't yeah. like us at all. So that was it. So, so we this were, is kind so, of turn of the century. Then. Yeah, yeah it was looking... 99. So 99 is when we finished the, the, you know, the last series of this morning, the second series of this morning. And we kind of knew it was they weren't going to do another one. They were, we'd been from... Meetings. The pre- John John Plan was the executive producer who was who tried to be supportive. Yeah. They let they let us they let us get, do whatever we wanted. And John Plan said, we, I remember coming and said, "There's something they wanted us to cut," and we said we wouldn't cut it, and which is amazing, right? Yeah. That's the executive producer, yeah, yeah. and he said it'll be much better for you in terms of getting another series if you cut this. Yeah. And we said we're not going to cut it. Right. But I know that if we'd cut it, we still wouldn't have got another series. Yeah. So it was that kind of, we were that pig-headed, but also behind what we were doing. But also, how the hell were yes, we able course. to tell executive producer that we were going <laughs> to no, do the no. thing? And it went out. <laughs> yeah, we did it. We, I mean, there was lots of edgy stuff on that show, and we pushed it. And You tasted different types of milk. Yeah, milk. I mean, animals. And we, you know, I was Just saying, to give people a flavour if they weren't yeah. familiar with well, there it. Was really. all, I, there was a lot of stuff about me having sex with animals. Yes. They're all like how I went in with the time milk. I finished with them. You know, there was things about there was a mouse escaped and went up my bum basically when it's up my mouse hole. Like I we said someone said twat live on TV. Yeah. I used to we used to sing this king song uh, when we'd crown someone in the audience as the king and I we'd go far 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 and I'd be going far 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 king far 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 king live on TV and every do it wow 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 wang king wang and I was doing this every week. Uh, and so you know we were doing we were being very naughty and no one was looking out for it because it was on it, at a time no one was expecting something this weird it was so, one of those things that could have become part of the furniture yeah yeah it? so but I think if we'd done another series it might have changed it. also if we'd been a little bit more we had so many ideas and so many characters that we didn't do that thing of repeating the same yeah, characters yeah, yeah. every week a little bit more uh, in this morning because we had yeah. to because we didn't have enough money sure um Weirdly, there was a great character that uh, Kevin Eldon did that we'd all worked on together, which is this fault guy pretending to be Rod Hull that had been in Fist of Fun. He's got the false Rod Hull, and for some reason he pretended to be Rod Hull to get jelly. It was a very long synthesis where it came up, but he was really funny. 
and we we recorded like loads of sketches of him for this this morning and i thought this this is going to be the time this breaks through and becomes like a national obsession yeah. Yeah. and we were sitting on the set ready to record the first one doing the re- dress rehearsal and someone came and said um it's bad news that rod, rod hull has fallen off, of his, fallen off his roof hasn't he? <laughs> so we obviously had to not, i mean it's probably worse for rod hull than it was probably, <laughs> but we but we obviously had to not you wouldn't do, have put that in a script no. you'd have been handed it back for being too important exactly well it would have been a perfect one of this because in the sketch every week the Rod Hull character died because he was unable to so uh, there was little bits of bad luck like that but also you know we were too inventive we were, tr- we were trying too many different things if we'd done another series who knows what would have happened like there's, and I'm really glad we didn't because it gave us both a chance to break up well break up without, without falling out um, but go off did- and do our own thing and, and also rediscover who we were and we both went through a little bit of a Wilderness. Today. Well, I'm more. I mean, obviously, I'm interested in your wilderness at the moment because some of the stuff that occurred during it, you nearly killed yourself writing for Al Murray. Yeah. <laughs> um, ten episodes in nine weeks. Uh, in, well, we, 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 collaboration, was, obviously. It, well, it was. It was sort of was, but it was actually a twenty. The first series was twenty three or twenty two, I think. Yeah, twenty two. But we, it was thirteen to begin. They gave us another nine halfway through the series. Ah, so you so I to... wrote nine episodes in ten weeks on my own because Al was recording them as of we course. were doing. So I was writing an episode a week. Uh, I was going in. We'd the rec- <laughs> we'd, we'd they recorded them on a Thursday. Um, I would be right. I'd be starting writing a new script on Wednesday. So I'd, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'd write a script. We'd read it on Friday. I'd go over with the weekend, rewrite it. On Monday, we'd have to nail it down. Yeah. Uh, Monday and Tuesday, and they'd this rehearse is, this it. This is high octane. Yeah. This is burnout stuff, Yeah, yeah. Isn't Monday it? and Tuesday, they'd rehearse it. Jesus. I'd be there on Tuesday to help them with the rehearsal. Then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, I'd start writing the next one. They'd, be, they'd record on Thursday. <laughs> And how uh, and how were you rational? Because we're going to run out of time, and we're not we're not close to <laughs> twenty eighteen yet. Okay. But how how did you deal then with no longer being on the stage? Were you cool with that? I was all right. I, I was I had a little part in the first series, yes, and it I was remember. and it was sorted. But it was you know it was only just for a bit of fun. And sure. then actually in the last episode of that, I, I wanted this. There was this thing where, and it was a little bit of an in joke as well. Although I was actually going out with Julius Soir at the time, but in, in Fist of Fun, Julius Soir had been my like fantasy pretend, my figure. fancy woman. I, I dream of a and woman so, with, with the head of Julius Soir <laughs> and the body of Julius Soir. <laughs> exactly. It's a very good life. <laughs> and so in uh, we started going out with each other for very, you know uh, as things like went, and that's partly why she was in that show. Sure. And so I had the I was a postman character who yeah. was obsessed with her, and she wasn't. She hated him. Right. And in the final episode, yeah. I wanted them to her to kiss him just for some spurious reason. She was trying to make someone jealous or something, and you know he, he exploded his world. And then the director said, you know, we've got too much stuff in this episode. And so I had to make the mature decision of, of cutting course, this this away. arc for this character. And so I didn't have him. And hey, Julia wasn't in the next series and we broke up. And this was the reason yeah. we went in the next series. Uh, and um, So, it yeah, wasn't, so you, what, you weren't gnashing your teeth and tearing No, no, I didn't mind. I was sort of, well, A, it was, I always wanted to write stuff as well. So yes. I'd love to be doing, I'd love to get, you know, that was what, I had 35 episodes of a sitcom on, I mean, it was on Sky, but yeah, it was yeah, on yeah. TV. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and we got paid a Proper ridiculous money. amount of money for it because yes. it was do- I was basically doing six years work in wait, wait, two years just, you know? just backing up slightly then at what point would you say you became financially secure in- only then I mean by the right. end of Lee and Herring we'd broken even I would say that was so, all so, yeah, so like even when- that's when we when I bought my flat we got, I think we got paid thirty thousand pounds each a series of, for writing yeah. and being in in those sh- those shows, you know, which is nice. Sure. It was a lot of money for me then, but of was course. not like a life changing amount no. of money. And so, like you know, we were you're paying rent for it, most of it, and then I put yeah, that yeah. ten grand deposit down on the ninety grand flat. Sorry, God, people of the amazing. people of now, so don't worry. Uh, about them. They're <laughs> spending all their money on avocado <laughs> toast. Oh, no. And you know, and so, but by the end of it, I was ba- I basically had zero pounds, but okay. I was living in a flat. And then I did that Dal Murray thing, and and, that and was a bad you know, cup. but it, but we would you know we got we got proper money. I got I was me and Al split the production fee, right? So it was like you know each week, and when I was writing an episode a week. That became my weekly wage. Yes, of course. And then there was loads of uh, repeat fees for that, which never happened to me. So that completely set me up. Okay. Um, you know. I, and then, I didn't know this, script editor on the third series of Little Britain, which sounds as if it was the opposite of doing the Al Murray thing. Yeah, well, it was. In terms of effort. And, yeah, exactly. Because they did it all themselves. Matt's, they did. Matt's done unfiltered. And yeah, well, it was, there was, it was no, there was no, nothing I could do. struggled to get a word in edgewise. Yeah, well, it was, you know, if you liked it, it's not my, because of me. If you didn't like it, it's not because of me. <laughs> yeah, so I went, I went into meetings and um, I would, I wrote, I wrote one character from them which I didn't use. 
and I, you know, but it was basically just going in and try. They, but weirdly, that was another thing that made me realise podcasting was the way forward, right? Because they were going into meetings and people at the BBC were saying, "No, you can't do that." Yes, and you're going, "This is the third series of this incredibly popular show," and they the BBC be able to ten- do whatever the hell. And they I just want. said to them, "Why would you not? Why would yeah. you go to the BBC, yeah. make it yourself, and then sell it back to the BBC? You know, and and sell it to everyone. It could be yours. You don't need the BBC. It's brooms, isn't it? It's people need to make their presence felt. Management, yeah, and yeah. commissioning people. The, the, well, the most also- confident are the ones who won't touch it. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone else feels they need to leave a fingerprint on. But they or... boys were the boys were pushing things like too far. I mean, I think they, right. I think they even the stuff that got on there. I think they, you know, now you look back at it and yes. go, that well, was they that do. was. Well, yeah, he does at least. Matt yeah. Lucas does. I haven't spoken to Dave. Uh, and you know, it was, but so it was sort of it was difficult to stop them doing things. It was, uh, you know, and so yeah, there was there was no there was no job to it at all. So it wasn't really. So then, I mean, fast forwarding violently, <laughs> you, you then did the, the series of one man shows, twelve or thirteen one man shows, themed uh, twelve tasks of Hercules. So it's dating fifty women in fifty days. What, so the idea comes, and then you w- work out. Well, it, that should have been the show, you know. Weirdly, yeah. so I had an idea of doing. I was living in a house which had a bust of Hercules on it. I was going through a bit of a, a depression. I'd broken up with someone. I was probably depressed. It's a nice show. It was the least. Uh, it was my least favorite at the time, and it did the worst. Right. But because uh, the problem was, I was trying to. I, I did a show which was an hour long show in Edinburgh where I tried to describe 12 incredible things I'd done one of which was dating 50 women in 50 days which yeah. is a show yes. um, and so I was emulating Hercules in various of his tasks Her- Her- Hercules had been <laughs> pregnated 50 women in a night so I did it I did it slightly <laughs> differently and I don't think I impregnated anyone uh, but uh, so yeah I just I set myself a series of challenge- challenges and it's a nice show because it's about someone going into a depression being a bit crazy and then finishing all this stuff and and coming out the other side when I redid them all I did all 12 shows quite recently yeah. and it was a really lovely one to do because it just felt imagine. like it just felt like oh god that was a, like a real proper journey like personally and I was doing crazy stuff I, I, um, and you're putting an arm around your younger self slightly yeah yeah well by doing all those old shows yeah it was, yes. but, you know, so I was 34 30, yeah about 34 at that time it was an amazing it, it, it was very very important show in in me becoming who I am. It right. gave me a it gave me yes, I did loads I of things. It gave me lots of confidence. I ended that show and I'd done three one man shows by that point. But I went, why am I not doing stand up? Why am I not going to clubs and doing stand up? So I'd done all these things that challenged me, and I thought, you know, I'm doing stand up, but I'm not calling it stand up. And why am I not? And so that yeah, okay. was what that's what pushed me back into going into the clubs and, and, and that pushing leads, myself. That leads to, to to the show that you're touring at the moment, but, yeah. but via also. Um, Richard Herring's Leicester Square Theatre podcast, yeah. which was a real game changer. Yeah, it? yeah. So all of these things, you know, I think that again, those decisions. I, mean, I met my wife ten years ago when I started podcasting ten years ago. Yeah, and both those decisions have like completely, obviously, changed my life in lots of ways. Uh, but yeah, the podcasting thing. Yeah, I'd been obviously doing. I've been doing the podcast with Andrew Collins, and then we'd kind of come to the end of that, and we'd not fallen out, but we'd had a disagreement. And I kind of liked doing it. And I thought, would it be possible just to do that show with a different person yeah. every week? Was was really the beginning part of the thought of it. And then it's turned into much more of an interview show. Yes. Uh, do you but, like asking the questions more than answering them? Um, I don't. I like I like both. And I yeah. like what I like about the, my podcast is I'm a, you know I'm allowed to sit back and let the other person talk. Or uh, my favourite ones are when we just start riffing yeah. with someone and you know it's nothing about anything and we both find something funny and off you go. But I also am, am fascinated by. Other, I'm fascinated by comedy and other mm. comedians still. And I love other comedians. I love the young comedians. I love the old comedians. So it's all really interesting to me. So I'm interested to find out about them and how they got where they It's given me a lot more respect for... I think, again, when we started, we just thought, you know, as much as I was insecure, we thought we knew everything about comedy and we thought everyone else was terrible. Yeah. You sort of have to. You have to believe that you're... Just because doing it's something. such a big push yeah, yeah. to stand up and yeah. go, I'm the well, business. And just to keep going, you have yes, to sort course. of have this idea. And so you'd be disparaging about everyone. other everyone. And then you meet them, and then you, and, you know, and then you meet the people who are really successful. Yeah. And I've had really great guests on this, as you yeah, clearly yeah. have on here. And you suddenly go, oh, I mean, most of them are really nice people yeah. still, and down to earth people. But they've all worked hard, and they've all, you know, and they're all incredibly talented. And you sort, and it, it's sort of fair. It, it, as as much as some great people aren't going to get to that point, all the great people who've got there, you've sort of got to be pretty great to get there. So you you see these people, and you realize how. Yeah, you know, someone again, someone like David Mitchell, just sure. so witty and so sharp and so clever, and he's brilliant on my podcast because he treats me in exactly the right way with this sort of disdain, but <laughs> like he treats me like an intelligent ten-year-old, you know. <laughs> and it's that's good. That's how it should be. But yeah, so it's so I've, I've, I love doing it, and it's it's always it's different every week, and it's even those elements of it are the same, and it's it's always 
nearly always fun. Sometimes it's you know it's difficult. We're improvising. I do two in a night. We're yes. improvising. Two in a night is tough. Yeah. And, and, and a live audience means that sometimes you don't know whether it's. I mean, you get an immediate feedback yeah. on whether it's as funny as you think it yeah, is yeah. or whether it's as magical. But sometimes, like last week, I didn't. The, the audience were quite quiet, right. and you know, maybe it was. And I was a bit ill, and I, was, I had Mackenzie Crook on. I really yeah. wanted to impress yeah, him, yeah, and of course. you know, and then you kind of just not. You feel like oh, I wasn't quite as good as I could have been. Yeah, but mostly I'm You're just wrong, really, though, can't you? Sometimes yeah. when and you, you are, think yeah. you've not got it right, you nearly you, always come off. And people, you have got it right, yeah. uh, which leads inexorably towards Oh Frig, I'm fifty. Yes, so which, I did a show called Oh Fuck, I'm forty. Yes, ten years ago, uh, where I was a very different man. It was just before I met my wife, and I was I know, and another kind of midlife crisis show. <laughs> and, so uh, how long are you going to live? I kind of got my I got my midlife crisis. Out of, well, I think the midlife is the middle bit, isn't yes, it? It's of not, it? It doesn't is. mean you have to get to eight. It's not. It's not an hour. <laughs> it will be in the end. We'll be able to locate the album. It we'll let, we'll let the it take. But I was, you know, I was living a, a very different life than I am now, and it's kind of interesting. I thought it'd be nice to. It's a not, you know, it's a nice idea to have to do a show every decade. I don't know mm. how many more decades there will be. Uh, I, I joke about this being the penultimate instalment of the yes. uh, of the franchise. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, so, but also, there's a big difference between me at, me at forty, me and fifty, because obviously I was single. And, that, and single. that's what it's about. Those yeah, big so it's life about changes. and it's about that whether at forty. I was really worried about um, whether I was too old to be childish, and right. like my my persona was so, you know, this this intellectual puerility is what yes. we, is what I've always done, and I, I think at forty I thought, oh god, now I might be too old. Now okay. it gets too embarrassing. Yeah. It's too weird, and that, you know, and also my life was I wasn't married and I didn't have kids, and had I blown everything out of the water, you know, by just you thought the ship had this. sailed. Well, yeah, in every way, you know, and 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 was was should I grow up? Right. Uh, at fifty, I'm. I've been forced to grow up in some ways, but I'm still childish. Yeah. And so it's still about that, but it's also I think about suddenly realizing you get over a certain hump, and then you're. It sort of becomes funnier to be childish as you get older as well. So all that's nice, but you've got a bit more wisdom at fifty. So it's about looking back and about understanding. You know, you feel like you're in the middle of your life, even though you're in the last yes, part of, of you your do. life. Uh, and you know, you've got it's that perspective. It's that perspective of my. You know my personal life and my career that I would didn't have ten years ago. Do the numbers resonate in real life? Because obviously forty and fifty in terms of birthday cards and parties and um, and, and and helpful headlines for shows. Yeah, they're, they're, they're big numbers. But I, I found forty six. I had forty six last month, and yeah. I found that much more troubling than either forty or forty five. Yeah. it's weird, isn't it? It it's, is weird. I mean, forty really hit me hard. Did it? And yeah, but I'm 50, waltz 50, through forty. I fifty doesn't fifty. I mean, I've got other stuff to worry about now. That's yeah, the thing. That's, I had nothing to worry about. When 40. <laughs> but like mid forties is mortality the though. Have you it taken is. mortality on board? Yeah, yeah, no, you so have. definitely. Yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed with death. My wife. I've done a whole show about death. Of course, my, you have. Yes. My wife is. Uh, uh, I have to not talk because I keep on talking about dying all the time. Well, Eric Cantona when he was sit- <laughs> when he was sitting in that chair, I asked him a similar question, and he paused for so long that I was worried that he <laughs> decided not to answer it, yeah. or and then just said he was he was going to find a way to overcome death. Oh God. If well, anyone, it could be. If anyone can. <laughs> it's really weirdly, I think mid 40s is worse than anything. Yeah. Because I think, like, you're still at 40. I mean, that's the difference now. At 40, I was, I look back and I was. I was quite fit and I sure. was handsome <laughs> and I was sexy <laughs> and uh, everything was working. There was no no no, no f- feeling anything could go wrong. I was st- you know young women were still finding me attractive. Yeah, it was yeah. and like at fifty and then my life's very different and I'm not trying to be attractive to young women. But still, I would like to be attractive, <laughs> but, but, still, I'm, be but I'm not. You know I'm not. And so there's all these things you have to cope with and things that start to go wrong. And it isn't until the mid forties that that really starts to happen. I think. So as a man, was you're lucky in lots of ways, but then it hits you as hard. And I think we're not as prepared because you you have this privileged lifestyle and that's yes, of you know and, and this entitlement and you don't realize and everyone does what you want and then suddenly you get 45 46 50 and people aren't so much bothered anymore and so no. you've got to you know women aren't that bothered about you work isn't that bothered about you you have to kind of come to terms with those things and i think that's why i mean there's there's a big subject but everything that's exploding at the moment is about these middle-aged boy men who suddenly haven't 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 quite yeah, and then suddenly realize that they're not as powerful as they were so exert or they exert their powers in ways that are horrific and that is why you are so relieved that you are in control of your own professional destiny yeah it was not you know it's that autonomy is great also understanding you know what's important it's just you know it's lovely to be on tour and i love doing the shows but it's great to come home and see my kids got those gigs cancelled because of the snow and you think oh it's terrible that's two days work out but then i got back to and i'm not stuck in a snowdrift. i'm with my family and it was hard they were it was hard one of the days but it's still 
you know, it's, it, it's great to have that to work for and to go back to that. Um, but yeah, you know, having a perspective and, you know, understanding your own unimportance. And that's all what the 50 show is about. It's yes. is knowing in the grand scheme of things how just time will roll over you. And, dust, dust. And you're gone. And dust from. to dust. Um, how, how can people see it? Uh, well, if you, go to, uh, if you go to richhane.com, you can see all the, the gigs are up on there. I mean, I'm sort of, it goes on till June, um, but it's, I'm doing two, it's quite, it's nicely paced. It's sort of two, yes. for me, it's like two or three a week. So it's not too exhausting. Especially um, a man of your age. Yes. You well, it is. It's, it takes take a toll. It, it, it takes does, it out of you. It's hard, man. It's, I'm having a, I've got a four-month-old, five-month-old really? son at home. Yeah, they're so not it's... going on the road with you. Okay. <laughs> they aren't, but it's still the tired. The tiredness never leaves you. So it's, um... <laughs> but yes, it's 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 a it's a fun show. I'm doing it in London on May the fourth. Doing the DVD on May the fourth. Richard Harry, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.